Chapter Seventeen of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen Learning that wonderful sunday which stood out forever in caroline bryant's life history as a marked day was moving toward sunset when she received a summons which sent her heart to fluttering dorothy had left her but a little while before with the information that she always spent that hour with papa when he did not have to go out to see some sick person and she had spent the time in looking carefully over the sunday school lesson because Dorothy had said that Papa would read it at family worship, and talk a little bit about it, and ask some questions. Caroline had a terror of being asked a question which she could not answer, and resolved, when she heard this, to take the first leisure minute for studying. She was just puzzling over a verse which she did not in the least understand, when Dorothy knocked at her door. "'Papa says we may go and see Mama a few minutes.' she said her face aglow with pleasure she has not been so well to-day and has not even seen me but to-night she feels better and has sent word that she wants to see you too will you come right away please caroline arose at once but if it had been possible for her to think of an excuse for not going she would certainly have given it her limbs trembled so she could hardly walk and she half thought that Dorothy must hear her heart beat. She could not explain why she had such a fear of Mrs. Forsythe, but it had been growing on her all day. However, she followed Dorothy and her father down the long hall to another part of the house. Dorothy was clinging to her father's hand and talking to him, so Caroline's silence was not noticed. The door opened very softly, and the newcomer found herself in a larger room than she had seen before. Dorothy turned at once toward the bed in the alcove, with a glad little murmur, and bent her head over the pillows. Despite her nervous tremor, Caroline's beauty-loving eyes could not help taking in, while she waited, some of the delights of that room. The carpet was so thick and soft that no sound of footfall, however heavy, could possibly be heard on it and the pattern suggested a lovely sunset the most exquisite order prevailed everywhere it did not look in the least like a sick room to caroline's eyes at least everything was elegant the easy chairs seemed almost like beds themselves and drawn near the bay window was a couch large and billowy piled high with cushions there were plants in the southern window, and flowers in the vases, and a wood fire in the grate. "'It is the hardest room to describe I ever saw,' wrote Caroline to Ben in the next letter. "'Everything is in it that ought to be, and everything in its place, and looks as though it always stayed there, and yet there is not a bit of stiffness such as there was when Mrs. Kedwin put her parlour in what she called complete order.' She had turned quite away from the bed, partly to still her own nervous excitement, and partly because of an innate sense of delicacy about watching Dorothy's greeting to her mother, and was apparently studying the roses in the vase when Dr. Forsythe spoke to her. "'Come here, Caroline, and make the acquaintance of Dorothy's mother.' She made her way across the room as best she could, and stood with glowing cheeks beside the bed a delicate hand almost as white as the frills of the white woolen wrapper was held out to her and a gentle voice said it is quite time i knew caroline she has stolen my dorothy's heart what a low sweet voice she had and the touch of her hand on caroline's was warm and tender caroline frightened as she was could not help answering the pleasant smile on the lady's face with one of her own Mrs. Forsythe held her hand and went on talking to her husband about the services of the day, about the Sunday school and who had taken the Bible class, quite as though she had been in the habit of attending, though it was years since she had been in church. Presently she said to Caroline, still in the same low-toned voice, "'Do you know we are very thankful to your mother for sparing you to help our little girl? Tell her so for me.' she will know just how a mother feels. "'My dear,' 
said the doctor you have talked quite long enough for this time i think i must send all your company away or they will disturb your dreams to-night mrs forsyth smiled on him drew the hand she held closer and said in low tones to caroline kiss me dear the startled girl leaned forward feeling much as she might if an angel had asked her for a kiss and touched her lips softly to the delicate cheek but the lady's kiss was nice and full right on the rosy mouth i feel that i can trust you dear she whispered and it rests me more than you can understand you will take care of my little girl for her mother will you not then caroline knew that she was ready to do anything for this fair sweet lady that it was possible for human being to do it almost seems as though i could lie there and be sick for her she told herself as she turned away and when she said that she had given the utmost stretch to her loving help of which she was capable for she could think of nothing she dreaded so much as the idea of lying in bed day after day and being sick it is surprising when one stops to think of it what a very short time it takes for us to become accustomed to an entirely different order of things from what we had known before for instance before caroline had been three weeks in her new home it seemed the most natural thing in the world for her to dress herself each morning in her pretty new suit and hurry through her breakfast and morning duties in time for a certain car the great schoolrooms with their rows and rows of desks and long halls the many flights of stairs the cases full of books the blackboards stretching down the length of the rooms the maps and charts and globes and all the modern furnishings of the schoolroom were growing to be matters of course to her and as for the gas lights and electric bells and speaking tubes and all the modern improvements of dr forsythe's house it seemed to her as though she had always used them she lived a very busy life and had no time for homesickness as for dorothy no little princess of long ago ever had a more faithful attendant than caroline was to her most carefully was she watched that she was not too tired or too warm or in any way unfitted for a walk to the car and her rubbers and wraps were looked after with equally vigilant eyes caroline sees everything papa said dorothy and thinks of everything i don't believe she forgets me for a single second god bless caroline said dr forsythe turning to her and resting on her brown head a hand that trembled a little even as his voice did he saw very plainly what caroline's eyes did not that his little white flower which was one of his pet names for dorothy would not need caring for very long had not caroline become almost extravagantly fond of her little charge on her own account she would still have delighted to care for her not only because she was dr forsythe's daughter but because she seemed almost to feel the pressure of that fair sick mother's lips and to hear her low voice say you will take care of my darling for her mother's sake will you not in addition to history grammar and the like caroline was taking another lesson not arranged for when she came she went one morning to the doctor's private room with a message for dorothy come in he had said nodding to her from the door which stood ajar if your errand is not pressing wait a minute until i have finished this letter caroline waited in silent astonishment dr forsythe was certainly not writing he was walking back and forth across the room and talking with his secretary who sat before a small table running his fingers over a curious little instrument of some sort not much larger than his two hands it made a little clicking noise caroline thought it must be some kind of a music box with the music shut off she thought the secretary would have been more respectful to shut off its soft click also while the doctor talked but he did not the remedy of which you speak said the doctor is nearly obsolete at least none of the leading physicians use it any more in my judgment it has worn itself out or been superseded 
because of recent discoveries in regard to this form of disease do i talk too fast for you he asked suddenly stopping before the secretary who was making the soft click clicking with all his might though his eyes were at that moment fixed on a row of books just in front of him caroline was so astonished that she forgot to notice what the doctor said next but gave her entire attention to the secretary and his musical instrument she saw a strip of paper not over a half inch in width gliding under a tiny roller and heaping itself up on the floor in soft masses she drew a step nearer and saw that this paper was covered with what looked like little straight marks as much alike as two peas in a pod she wrote to ben in her next letter and don't you think ben it was a writing machine he writes the secretary does just what dr forsyth says as fast as he can say it then when the doctor has gone on his round of calls the secretary reads over what he has written and copies it on his typewriter did you ever hear anything like that why i know you did i remember now you're telling me something about such a machine that you read of and rufus kedwin said he did not believe there was any such thing rufus never believes anything that he has not seen does he if he were here a little while i could show him several things he does not believe could be found all this to ben the doctor turned at last and smiled on her puzzled face as he said is that something new it is a stenograph have you time to tell her a little bit about it edwards she carries eyes which are interested in everything new if you have time to stop caroline he will show you how it works but first what is wanted of me i must be off her errand done caroline gave ten happy minutes to learning about the queer little machine thinking in her heart all the while what a description she would write of it to ben who liked all sorts of machinery especially if it had to do with writing it is very queer indeed she said it does not seem as though one could ever learn to read that why it is nothing but dashes and they are all just exactly alike to a dot said edwards laughing but if you look closely you will see that they do not by any means occupy the same space on paper nor are there by any means the same number of them on a straight line and their position on the paper show what letter they stand for it does not show me said caroline looking steadily at the slip of paper with an unutterably puzzled look i presume not any more than the dictionary would have shown you how to spell a word before you knew the letters you have to master the alphabet first just as you do with any language is it hard said caroline wistfully not at all hard a wide-awake girl ought to learn to read it in a couple of weeks if you like i will teach you how to read and write too for that matter the doctor will have no objection i presume he heartily believes in people learning all they can in this world he says one can never tell where one is going to chink in i must tell that to ben anyway said caroline delightedly he is always saying such things and we never know where he gets them unless he thinks them out she hushed back a little sigh over this last sentence it seemed to her sometimes very strange that she should be having all the advantages and ben all the work and yet how eager he was to learn and how much he would have profited by her opportunities i will learn everything i can she told herself resolutely whether i like to learn it or not i will do it if i can get a chance just so i can teach it to ben when i go home this was the beginning of new lessons dr forsyth on being told of the plan seconded it warmly learn to read and write the stenograph by all means he said the little machine is going to work a reform in the art of writing some day the sooner people realize it and study it the better a good typewriter and stenographer can earn his living and the machine is destined to be used more and more when people get acquainted with it all this was told to ben of course in addition to what had already been written the very next letter had in it a slip of narrow paper filled with neatly made dashes that is a bible verse caroline explained 
it is come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest i chose it because it has nearly all the letters of the alphabet in it and i wanted you to see them i know them all now i dreamed about them and said them over in my sleep until i could not forget them you see ben there are word signs as well as letters that very first letter which stands all alone is c and stands for come the next letter is u and the next n and the next t and the next o and then comes the letter m which stands for me is it not queer you can't think how i like it i have taken a lesson on the machine every day since i wrote to you about it i wrote that bible verse myself and mr edwards says there is not a mistake in it and that i did well the machine is such a little darling i just love to make it click it has nine keys no ten counting the space key but there are only five dashes to make i could not understand at first what was the need of so many keys when they kept telling me that it could not make but five marks but i have found out there is one in the middle for the thumb to use and then the four each side of it are just alike i mean they make just the same marks on the paper well all the marks are just alike but what i mean is they put the marks in the same place on the paper i wonder if you understand it it does not sound clear at all i'll tell it different the dash which is at the top of the paper is always s now suppose you wanted to make the letter s on the machine you touch the last key on the right hand and it is made a single dash at the very top of the paper but if you touch the last key on the left hand it is made again it is so with each key whether you use your right or your left hand you will make the same characters do you see that is so you can write real fast and not take time to jump your fingers over to the right or the left at first it does not seem as though that would make any difference but when you watch mr edwards write for a while you know it does did not i really tell you the name of the machine how queer it is a stenograph oh ben how i wish you had one then we could write to each other on it wouldn't that be fun but they cost twenty-five dollars mr edwards writes the doctor's letters on his and his lectures and everything he wants written the doctor just walks the floor and talks and mr edwards clicks away and looks around the room is not that the greatest writing you ever saw ben said as having told its story and examined the curious slip of paper for the dozenth time he passed it to rufus kedwin rufus glanced at it his curiosity had been satisfied at the first look some time ago there's no writing about it he said loftily that fellow is fooling her line is awfully easily fooled sometimes i don't believe anybody can make reading out of just a lot of dashes that are all alike but didn't i tell you that line had learned the alphabet and could read it herself she wrote this and read it too what do you mean anyhow you don't think line would undertake to fool me do you she might said rufus coolly what does she want to putter with such things for anyway she hasn't a machine and if she had what good would it do her that's just exactly like line to go on learning things she hasn't any use for and never will have you've turned profit haven't you said ben good-naturedly he had been provoked for about one minute then he reflected how utterly foolish it was to be provoked with a boy who amounted to no more than rufus kedwin i don't know how you or anybody else is going to tell yet a while whether line will ever have any use for that she has done pretty well with things that she has learned so far hm said rufus it was not exactly a sneer but there was a contemptuous sound in it which made ben's face flush he understood what it meant and concluded like the wise boy that he sometimes was not to say one word in reply End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain 
chapter eighteen machines and news ben's very next letter to caroline had in it this sentence i am tremendously interested in your dashes i always am interested in new things you know especially if they have any machinery about them suppose you write me a letter on the thing you might send a translation of it at the same time but i am learning the alphabet from the slip you sent and i have a fancy to see if i could make any words out of your letter this sentence caroline read to dorothy and that evening she told her father about it good said the busy man in his cheeriest tones you and i ought to be acquainted with ben pussy how shall we manage it perhaps we will write him a letter ourselves one of these days i think your father is wonderful said caroline following his retreating form with admiring eyes dorothy gave a happy little laugh i have always thought so she said but what makes you say so just now why it is so wonderful that when he has so many and such important things to think of and people waiting for him and all that that he should take the trouble to think about ben and be interested in him it seems strange seems like a very great man not but what ben is worth thinking about she said with flushing cheek but then he doesn't know him you see dorothy laughed again papa isn't like any other papa she said he is like i will tell you caroline who i think he is like i don't say it often because it wouldn't sound right people wouldn't understand what i meant but i think he is like jesus christ caroline gave a little start of surprise she had never heard just that said about anybody and it did sound strange but the more she wondered about it the more she thought it might be so he went about among sick people and poor people a great deal just as she knew jesus did when he was on earth and just as far as he was able he cured the sick and he had always a kind word for everybody he met he certainly must be a little like jesus and then this young girl who had known about jesus all her life felt her cheeks tingle with a thought which almost made her ashamed she already felt that she not only respected but loved dr forsythe and wanted to please him in every possible way why did she not love jesus christ and feel anxious to please him it is because i do not know him she told herself as alone in her room that night she thought of it again while she was brushing her hair and braiding it for the night it is different but i cannot help feeling that it is if i could see him and hear him talk and watch his beautiful life i am sure i should love him then she opened her bible to read the few verses that she had always been in the habit of reading quite by herself just before she knelt down to pray it seemed very strange in fact almost made her feel afraid to see that the verse she opened to began blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed was jesus thinking that thought about her at that moment i am not sure but just then the first real desire to be a christian that she ever felt in her life came to caroline bryant she had often feebly wished for a few moments that she were one as one might wish for the moon perhaps but to-night she said in her heart it must be good to have him for a real friend and know that you love him and are pleasing him oh why am i not one of his friends new things or at least things which were new to caroline were very common in dr forsythe's house the next one which interested her deeply she found in the kitchen none of her duties lay in that direction and it happened that she had been in the house for several weeks before she had done more than pass through it one morning she was sent to the cook with a message from mrs packard and stopped in astonishment near the door to listen to a peculiar rumbling noise what in the world can that be she said to herself something must be wrong with the steam pipes i wonder if i ought to go somewhere and try to find out why the noise comes from the kitchen the cook must be there the noise ceased as suddenly as it had come and no harm appeared to have resulted 
caroline pushed open the kitchen door and found not only the cook but nancy the dining-room girl standing beside a large shining box and watching with apparent satisfaction a stream of soap suds falling out from a faucet underneath inside the box were rows and rows of dishes platters vegetable dishes cups saucers glasses spoons in short everything which had a little while ago been on the well-filled breakfast table was arranged in orderly rows within that box each group of dishes seemed to have rooms of their own the saucers fitted into neat little wire shelves which apparently had been made to receive them the cups looked down on them from wire shelves above while quite down below was another division altogether where the plates and other heavy dishes had it all their own way nancy laughed merrily over the puzzled look on caroline's face the two had been good friends since the evening caroline had offered to finish setting the table and let nancy go out on an errand which she was eager to do did you never see anything like this before she asked as she spoke she dashed a pailful of water over the dishes which caroline knew from the steam that arose must have been very hot she gave an involuntary start toward the cut glass pitcher and said why nancy you'll break the glasses oh no i won't said nancy in perfect unconcern they have been tempered in the first water and will bear it pretty near to boiling now they have been washed and i am going to rinse them off down went the cover and grasping the handle nancy turned it vigorously the surprising noise was accounted for only a few turns and again she opened the faucet let the water flow out and dashed still another pailful over the steaming dishes there she said with a triumphant air as she raised the cover once more now dry you are hot enough to do it in a hurry and my morning's work is done in short order wouldn't you like to wash and rinse and dry dishes as quick as that if you had them to do i never saw anything like it in my life said caroline in intense admiration nor heard of anything like it do you always wash dishes that way three times a day said nancy triumphantly a great army of them we use the most dishes in this house of any place i ever heard of every time kate turns around she uses seven or eight fresh ones it used to make me downright vexed but since we got this thing i don't care it don't turn no harder when it's full than when it's half full isn't it wonderful said caroline reaching for a cup and admiring the fine polish on its shining surface oh dear what a comfort such a machine would be to a woman i know your ma i suppose said nancy sympathetically if she has as many dishes to wash it certainly would caroline laughed she had visions just then of the large machine in her mother's already too crowded room washing her few small dishes it is not my mother she has a little bit of a family and only a few dishes to wash but a lady lives a little way from us who keeps a boarding-house and she does have such hard work to get her dishes washed clean it takes a great deal of time she told me once she had harder work to get a dishwasher to suit her than she did a cook it is harder to do than cooking said nancy take it year in and year out i would rather cook than wash dishes in the old-fashioned way enough sight but with this thing it is all done up in a few minutes and off your mind caroline did not know that nancy could not have cooked even a simple dinner if she had tried but the cook did and giggled then caroline did her errand and ran away her mind full of the new machine and what a thing it would be if fanny and rufus kedwin could get their mother one for christmas the word christmas made her sigh the idea of being away from home on that day of all others but hard upon the sigh came a smile for she already knew several pretty secrets for christmas that afternoon as she and dorothy came from school dr forsythe opened the door of his reception room and invited them in it was after office hours and he was alone 
here is a letter for you he said to caroline come in here and read it if you wish while i talk with this young lady a bit and he dropped into a great leather-covered chair and gathered dorothy into his arms beginning to take off rubbers and wraps as he asked about the day's delights for school life was one long drawn-out delight to dorothy presently an exclamation of astonishment slightly tinctured with dismay made them both run toward caroline no unpleasant news i hope said the doctor caroline blushed and smiled no sir it is good news i suppose but you are not quite sure dorothy laughed why caroline she said you spoke exactly as though you were not quite sure and how could that be all news are either so very good or so very bad there is no halfway about them is there father not to a nature like yours said her father regarding her with the fond grave smile with which he often looked at his fair darling well said caroline slightly embarrassed there are two people coming to the city whom i know and of course i shall like to see them if i have a chance but and here she stopped friends of yours asked the doctor yes sir at least i thought they were yes sir they are friends of course we used to be quite intimate but she really did not know how to express herself and this accounted for those awkward pauses is that a conundrum for dorothy and me to guess dr forsyth asked smiling kindly no sir with a little embarrassed laugh what i mean is i do not know whether they will want to see me now then her cheeks flamed and she felt that she had said a very strange thing dr forsyth knew her but very little and he did not know her mother or ben at all what would he think she had been doing to make her feel that perhaps friends with whom she had once been very intimate might not want to see her now what could he think but that something very wrong in some way had happened yet how was she to explain to him what she really meant her embarrassment was painful but the doctor did not seem inclined to help her he sat looking thoughtfully at her with a kind and yet a grave face what he was thinking was something very different from caroline's supposition he did not distrust her in the least and he had received letters enough from mrs bryant to come to his own conclusions about her the thought uppermost in his mind just then was what a mercy and a blessing it has been to us to secure to our darling such a girl as this to be with her all the time a wise patient loving womanly little girl who can be trusted and whom dorothy loves with all her heart i shall certainly never forget one who makes so bright my darling's days but the thought which always shadowed this father came with force to him just then none knew better than he how few his darling's days might be caroline mistaking the gravity came to a sudden conclusion she reached forth the letter with a quick nervous gesture dr forsyth she said have you time just to read that page then you will know what i mean i will read it with pleasure if you would like to have me do so the doctor answered is it from ben from ben and mother a little piece of it is mother's and dr forsyth read i've great news for you line fanny and rufus kedwin are going to philadelphia for the holidays that uncle of theirs about whom they are always talking has sent them money enough to go and mrs kedwin is working half the night trying to get them prinked up mother is helping her some rufus feels very large and talks to fanny until she thinks she feels large too only she forgets to carry it out sometimes they are both as silly as ever more so in fact i'm going to tell you what they said last night so you will understand things and not feel troubled they were over here with their mother getting advice from our mother about how to make over a dress and some other things i said to rufus it seems funny to think of your seeing line in a few days humph rufus said i don't know whether we shall see her or not she has done such a queer thing 
that I think she does not expect to have much to do with her friends. What do you mean? I asked, and he laughed and looked half ashamed for a minute. Then he said, well now, Ben, there's no use in going around a thing forever. You know it is very odd in line to go and be just a common servant. My uncle's folks don't associate with such people, and they might think it queer if we had much to do with her. I think it was downright mean in line to go and do such a thing when she wasn't obliged to. It makes it awfully disagreeable for her friends. I felt for a moment as though I should like to knock him but I held my tongue until I could speak about as usual. Then I said, Line is a rather uncommon servant, I think you will find. Yes, said Fanny, putting her voice in eagerly, as though she wanted to do something to make things pleasant. I know she must be splendid. I should like to be rich and have Line to wait on me. I should like nothing better. Well, that was sillier than anything even Rufus had said, but she meant it well, so I could afford to laugh, and I said I could think of several things Line would like better, but of course they need not go and see her unless they chose. Oh, of course we will see her, Rufus said. We will go once anyhow, because we have those things of your mother's to take to her, and that will be excuse enough to give to our uncle. But of course we cannot do as we would if she was not living out." I do not suppose they want to have people ringing the bell and asking to see her anyhow. Mother says they won't, that people never like it. Well, there was a good deal more of that kind of stuff, that I need not waste the paper to write down. I am only taking the trouble to tell this, so that you will understand things better when they come, and not be hurt, you know. They are not worth your thinking of them twice, and you and I know it. If they would stay away entirely, I would be glad. Then I would have kept still about their silly talk. But mother asked them to take your sack and a few little things from Daisy before we thought how they would feel. The truth is, I did not know before that they were such dreadful simpletons. Then followed a few lines in another hand. Ben has written you somewhat more fully than was worth while, daughter, about poor Rufus and Fanny though I advised him to tell you just how they felt, that you might not be unpleasantly surprised when you met them. I hope my daughter will have pity for the follies and failings of her friends. They are hardly to be blamed. They have been surrounded all their lives by people who held false views of life, so that very much cannot be expected of them. I continually hope for them that some influence may come to both in time to save them, else their lives will be a failure if my caroline will learn to pray for them and will cultivate the sort of feeling which belongs to earnest prayer she may be able to save them both end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of twenty minutes late by pansy the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen entertaining company that is a letter to be proud of, said Dr. Forsythe as he returned it. Not every girl has a mother who lives so as to be able to write it. Now about these friends of yours, when do you say you expect them, and do you know where their uncle lives? Caroline named a street and number. She did not know where it was, but the doctor recognized it as one of the obscure streets of the city a long distance from his home. They are to come on Monday, you say? Well, let me see. On Tuesday they will probably be busy with their relatives. How would it do to send the carriage for them on Wednesday, and have them here when you and Dorothy return from school? You would like that, would you? The carriage? said Caroline, almost gasping the words. No thought of such remarkable distinction as that had occurred to her as being given to any of her friends. Certainly, said Dr. Forsythe, smiling. It would save you a long trip down there to call upon them, and save time in every way. Then we could have them remain to dinner with us, and get acquainted with your surroundings. You would have time to take them to drive, perhaps, and finally return them safely to their uncle's house by dark. I think that will be the better way to manage. That is, if you would like to show them such attention." 
am i to understand that it would give you pleasure to do so caroline's eyes answered for her even before she spoke nothing that had ever happened to her gave her more thorough satisfaction to be able to show attention to fanny and rufus to show them just how she was treated in this elegant home to which she had come to give them the pleasure of a ride in a handsome carriage behind fine horses to be able to act as mistress of ceremonies and show them some of the wonders of city life nothing that the doctor had planned could give her greater pleasure oh dr forsythe she began i don't know how i cannot tell what to say nor how to say it he interrupted her with a genial laugh never mind you have said it or your eyes have for you it is a very convenient thing sometimes to have eyes that talk very well we will consider it settled then that the carriage goes on wednesday to meet your friends i hope it will be a pleasant day and that you will have a good time and be able to show them every possible attention help them to feel at home in the city and help them to realize that you feel at home as for dorothy here she likes new people and i feel sure it will give her great delight to assist in entertaining them and then dr forsythe who had spent more time than he often had to bestow upon them hastened away never was a brighter day than wednesday the sun seemed to be doing what it could to celebrate the coming of fanny and rufus kedwin to philadelphia if the truth must be told however these two young people away from home for the first time were the least bit in the world homesick the cousins were older than themselves and on this particular afternoon had an engagement which it was impossible to avoid so they said and had left fanny and rufus to the care of their aunt she good woman was doing the best to entertain them calling the baby to her aid but the two who were accustomed to a great deal of exercise in the open air as the day wore along found it very dismal to be sitting in a small dark room at least it seemed dark to them looking out on a narrow street where nothing of very special interest was going on fanny turned from the window at last with a long-drawn sigh and said aloud i wish we could see caroline this afternoon don't you rufus who is caroline questioned the aunt and an explanation followed a servant girl eh she said with lifted eyebrows i don't know i am afraid it will be rather difficult to plan your seeing her people do not like to have their servants receive company you know it isn't always convenient besides dr forsythe lives a long way from here was your mother willing to have you go there fanny hastened to keep up the dignity of the family mother didn't know she said we must get caroline's package to her and that we must remember we were neighbors at home and really we would truly like to see her she is a good girl oh i have no doubt of it but her circumstances are different than yours however we will ask your uncle about it and bring it to pass if we can if we cannot plan so as to make it convenient for you to go there we can send the package so that it will be all right don't worry about it rufus had taken no part in this conversation for the reason that he was engaged in watching the movements of a splendid span of horses that were apparently picking their way through the narrow and muddy street the driver rufus thought was as fine a looking gentleman as he had seen in the city to his great surprise and of course delight the horses were reined in before his uncle's door and he turned with marked excitement to his aunt aunt fanny there is a splendid carriage and a magnificent span of horses stopping here and the driver is getting down and coming to the door who do you suppose he wants dear me said aunt fanny i don't know i wish your uncle was at home he is on business of course fanny will you take the baby and let me see what it is hannah is always out when i need her most she left the door ajar and to their great delight they could hear every word that passed between their aunt and the stranger dr forsythe's compliments and would it be convenient for miss fanny and mr rufus kedwin to dine with miss caroline bryant that evening 
the doctor had sent the carriage for the purpose of taking them to his house rufus and fanny looked at each other could they believe their ears a carriage for the purpose of taking them to dine with caroline bryant what in the world does it all mean muttered rufus then came his aunt excited and voluble a bustle of preparation followed while that gentlemanly coachman paced back and forth on the pavement and the high-stepping horses arched their necks and pawed the ground before they had thoroughly realized what wonderful thing had happened to them rufus and fanny were bowling along in a carriage the like of which they had never entered before they had not yet recovered their senses enough to talk to each other and indeed their eyes were so busily engaged in gazing out of the window on the strange sights which everywhere presented themselves as soon as they were in one of the main streets that they had no desire to talk but the drive was long and before they had reached dr forsythe's they found their tongues again and began once more to wonder what it could all mean dear me said fanny looking out at last on the house which seemed to her magnificent and which bore the name forsythe on the door-plate i must say i'm a little bit scared rufus do you suppose there could be some mistake what is there to be scared about growled rufus they sent for us and here we are if they hadn't wanted us they needn't have sent it will be fun to see line anyhow by the time their wraps were disposed of and they were seated in state in what seemed to them a grand parlor caroline came was it caroline it is true that not very many weeks had passed since they had seen her but this young girl who came eagerly forward to meet them wore such a pretty dress and had her hair done in such a new-fashioned way and altogether looked so much like what fanny called cityfied that for a moment she was almost abashed but there was no mistaking caroline's greeting she was unaffectedly and heartily glad to see them she asked dozens of questions about home and mother and daisy and ben just to think she said looking at them that you saw my mother and all of them only the other day oh dear i'm afraid you make me almost homesick i shouldn't think you need be homesick here said rufus looking around him with intense curiosity say line what does it all mean what asked caroline laughing why this how did you happen to ask us to come here and send a carriage for us and everything i thought you were a a caroline interrupted him laughing again you thought i worked for my living didn't you well i do at least they say i do only it doesn't seem to me that i do anything at all except go to school and study and have good times then came dorothy fair and sweet in her white dress and with her gentle womanly ways she fascinated fanny at once it was a day to be remembered forever in the annals of the kedwin family from thenceforth for years they dated their experiences from that day when we took dinner at dr forsythe's you know caroline showed them all over the beautiful house they went to the library to the conservatory to the music room and saw pictures and flowers and books and what was more to both of them i am afraid than all of these elegant furniture such as they had never seen before truth to tell dr forsythe would have been astonished had he known that they considered everything about his establishment magnificent to those accustomed to the real elegance of city life this was only a large plain pleasantly furnished cheerful house but to fanny and rufus kedwin it was paradise caroline took them to her own room there the two stared about them in astonishment over the beauty and elegance everywhere displayed you don't say you have this all to yourself said fanny i thought you slept with dorothy and took care of her oh no indeed dr forsythe doesn't allow anyone to sleep with her he doesn't think it is healthful but the nurse sleeps very close to her with folding doors between and they are left open 
no i do not have any care for her at all at night dr forsyth says i am too young to have any burden of care upon me while i ought to be sleeping he must be tip-top said rufus he is the best man i ever knew said caroline promptly presently came the summons to dinner the light and beauty of the great dining-room the many courses served with exquisite taste and care especially the elegant grandmother hushed rufus and fanny into almost utter silence perhaps however the thing that astonished them most that evening was the fact that the dignified table waiter always said miss caroline and waited with as much deference to see how he could serve her as he did before the grandmother herself after dinner came the wonderful ride through the brilliantly lighted streets of the city the young folks resting back luxuriously among the cushions of the carriage do you often have a ride in this thing rufus asked every pleasant day said caroline in an unconcerned tone look rufus there is our school building that is where dorothy and i go every morning that's my room up there on the third floor oh fanny you don't know what a splendid school it is you take music lessons and all don't you asked rufus yes indeed oh i like the music teacher ever so much he has a quick sharp way of speaking and some of the girls think he is cross but he isn't a bit oh fanny if you and rufus and ben could all be here at this school wouldn't it be perfectly splendid the fact is their young hostess was in a perfect flutter of delight what a thing it had been for dr forsythe to invite them to dinner and send the carriage for them and treat them in every way as if they were distinguished guests he could not have done any more if i had been his own daughter caroline reflected as she rode back alone having bade a cordial good-bye to her friends and promised to come and see them if she could but it is a very long way she said from our house you know and we are very very busy getting ready for the holidays she did not hear what rufus said as he went grumblingly up his aunt's steps it seems to me line puts on a good many airs about we and us and the holidays and all the next thing you know she'll be getting stuck up and feel above us i don't think she seemed a bit stuck up said the gentler fanny and i had a real good time rufus i'm glad she has such a nice place isn't dorothy lovely she has all the nice times she and ben he said as they waited on the low white doorsteps for someone to let them into the house i always said ben bryant had all the luck there was in the world some folks do have no such nice times as line is having ever came to you fanny or ever will this time even fanny could not help laughing a little certainly he had never found it necessary to envy line bryant before to caroline sitting back among the cushions watching the many scenes of interest and thinking her thoughts there came the memory of a day when she stood looking disconsolately out of the window watching a handsome carriage pass and said to ben i believe i could step gracefully into a carriage if i had a chance i wonder if i ever will have a chance here she was having her chance and it had not even occurred to her to notice whether she stepped gracefully into the carriage or not she laughed a frank glad laugh as she thought of that foolish sentence and of how little after all graceful steps and matters of that kind amounted to when one came to real living and wondered whether her other dreams fancies that had been so numerous if time should ever bring them to pass for her as it had the stepping into the handsome carriage would amount to as little as that did then she dismissed them from her mind altogether and gave herself up to the delights of the coming christmas and the thought of the surprises she was getting ready for mother and daisy and ben she remembered how good dr forsythe was to make it possible for her to have such surprises and altogether was glad and thankful and happy hey called a shrill voice on the sidewalk just as they were passing through one of the side streets to reach a main avenue 
and leaning forward caroline saw a woman gesticulating eagerly apparently to the coachman joseph who seemed to have eyes on every side of him when he drove saw her and promptly reined in his horses caroline leaning forward heard isn't that dr forsythe's carriage i thought so is he inside look here can't you drive straight home and tell him my dory has got hurt dreadful he's been to a fire it's his leg i guess it's broke and i don't know what to do and the folks don't know what to do i can't find no doctor that knows what he is about they have just sent that little green fellow with white hair and no eyebrows from the hospital and he don't know much i guess anyhow i'm most sure that dr forsythe would come if he knew can't you let him know right straight off joseph expressed his willingness to make all possible speed home and report as to the accident you know me said the woman don't you i'm miss perkins the doll maker dr forsythe will know he knows just where i am and about dory and everything miss perkins the doll maker caroline had heard the name before for the first time since she had been in philadelphia it dawned upon her that she was in the city where lived the woman who had made so many of daisy's dolls miss perkins doll maker was to be found on almost every dolly that caroline's patient fingers had dressed she and daisy had often wondered together about her how she came to make dolls for a living why she made them whether she had little children who loved to watch her work at them whether she learned to love the dollies and think about them afterwards and wonder who their mothers were whether they were nicely cared for and their clothes kept neat here was a chance to find out she had a dory anyway and he was in trouble caroline felt almost as eager to get home as miss perkins had been to have them and offered to carry the message at once to the doctor while joseph waited outside End of chapter 19chapter 20 of 20 minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 20 great questions settled for a wonder the doctor was in and at leisure he recognized miss perkins's name at once and himself opened the door and called to joseph that he might take him in a few minutes to her house turning to caroline he asked do you know anything about her caroline your face looks as though some friend of yours had had an accident then very briefly caroline told the doll story and explained how often daisy had wondered about miss perkins she has no one to care for but this poor nephew of hers the doctor explained but he has given her more trouble than if she had half a dozen children of the ordinary kind dory is inclined to live on the street altogether too much for his good would you like to go down there with me and see the doll maker and her nephew you might possibly make yourself useful startled as she was at the thought of a ride with dr forsythe alone and a call upon strangers she yet could not resist the temptation what a thing it would be to tell daisy that she had seen the doll maker herself and perhaps there would be dolls scattered around in different stages of development waiting to be described on the whole caroline decided that it would be a wonderful ending to a wonderful day did you enjoy your visit with your friends was the first question dr forsythe asked as the carriage rolled away oh yes said caroline eagerly dr forsythe i thank you so much it was such a wonderful chance to show fanny kedwin all sorts of things that she wouldn't have had a chance to see and then besides and she came to one of her full pauses yes said the doctor encouragingly and then besides she turned toward him with a bright little laugh and a flush on her face i don't know quite how to put the besides i don't know whether it was nice in me or not to feel a little glad that they should see what a pretty room i had and how sweet dorothy is and how good everybody is to me there is nothing especially wicked about that said the doctor with a grave smile 
provided you let it stop at just the right point if you were glad because you thought they would be relieved and would have a pleasant story to tell your mother and it would cheer her heart and because it would help them to get a little better view of life than they had had that is one thing but suppose you had been glad because you knew they would be discontented because their uncle's house didn't happen to be situated quite so pleasantly as they thought yours was or because their uncle's horses didn't go as fast as ours do that you could see would be quite another matter caroline's flush deepened and she answered only with respectful silence truth to tell she was only too conscious that there was at least a little bit of this feeling lurking in her heart not so much for fanny as for rufus kedwin he had been such a hopeless boaster and had said such disagreeable things about her to ben she could hardly help a little feeling of triumph over him the doctor's next question startled her so that she nearly tumbled from her seat are your young friends christians oh no sir she answered i don't believe they think much about such things their mother isn't a christian dr forsyth they don't go to church any of them much their mother keeps boarders and she has to work very hard and fanny and rufus don't like to go to church they go to sunday school but they don't attend church except when they can't help it but that doesn't surprise me very much i didn't use to like to go when i was at home our minister is well i don't know what he is dr forsyth he is just as different from your minister as anything can be going to church ought not to be a matter of liking or not liking the minister you know said dr forsyth with his kind smile we are supposed to go to church to worship god but i grant you that most people think too much of the minister part as to whether he is agreeable or not i mean but my question reminds me of a more important one which i have been intending to ask you for some time how is it with caroline bryant is she a christian silence for what seemed to caroline a long embarrassing time then she said speaking low i don't know dr forsyth i know i was not when i was at home mother and daisy and ben are and i know it used to almost provoke me sometimes that ben thought so much about these things he didn't seem to belong to me so much you know but since i have come here and have heard little dorothy read in the bible and heard her pray and heard you pray dr forsyth i feel very differently but i don't feel at all sure that i am a christian i want to be i think i try to be but i am not even quite sure what it is to be a christian it is a very simple matter said dr forsyth and one that can be decided in a few minutes you may not be a christian now but if you honestly want to be there is no reason in the world why you should not become one before you leave this carriage to-night caroline looked her surprise i thought christians had to be very different from other people a christian said the doctor is one who takes the lord jesus christ for his pattern and tries to think and speak and act as he would have him now you can see that it rests with you to decide whether you desire to do this and intend to do it sometimes people have a passing wish to become christians but it is not strong enough to stay with them and rule their lives they do not come to a positive decision they think and hope and say perhaps to-day and to-morrow forget all about it and the next day think a little again but fail to bring themselves to that one point where the soul says with all the power that is in it i will just as soon as you reach that point my dear caroline you become a christian but caroline still looked bewildered do not people have to have their hearts changed she asked timidly indeed they do but that is the lord's part we have nothing to do with it what he has given to us is to decide let me see if i can not make it plain by illustration you know when i asked you to come and stay with us at our house and care for dorothy and be a helper to us all you thought about it a great deal and was doubtful one hour you felt as if you would come and the next hour as if you would not for anything and i meantime did not know what your decision was 
could not plan for you in any way but there came a moment when the thing was settled when you said to me i will come dr forsyth and do the best i can do you not see that there was one moment when the question was unsettled and the next when it was settled so far as you were concerned and for that matter so far as i was concerned for the moment i received your answer i knew how to arrange the illustration is faulty for our father in heaven knows what our decision will be nevertheless from our side it is plain enough he has seen fit to give this part of the matter to us we must come to a conclusion we must decide and once for all that as for us we are resolved to take jesus christ for our pattern and serve him as well as we can the question is is caroline bryant resolved to do this does she mean to decide it to-night silence for a minute then caroline's voice low but firm i want to dr forsyth he turned his kind gray eyes upon her and smiled the question is will you he said are you so sure you want to that you are willing to bow your head now and here and say jesus christ i have decided to take thee for my pattern to try to serve thee in all that i say or do or think wilt thou take me from this moment and make me thine own i do not mean of course that you must use just those words but that is the thought which you will express are you willing to do this it required a struggle to answer caroline felt that she was willing to say the words but to say them before dr forsyth was another matter she hesitated and looked up at him almost pitifully with eyes full of tears but he had no further word to speak and simply waited suddenly she came to a fixed resolve she wanted to be a christian she meant to be one if this was the way she would do it what if she did blunder and stammer and get the words all mixed up dr forsyth would not care and surely jesus christ would not if she really meant them with all her heart down went her head into her hands and a tremulous yet very distinct voice murmured jesus christ i want to be thine own i want to serve thee i want to speak and act and think just what thou wouldst have me and if thou wilt take me i will begin to serve thee now instantly dr forsyth's voice took up the story lord jesus thou hast heard the words of this thy young servant take her from this moment for thine own forever and help her in all ways to honour the saviour to whom she belongs this thou hast promised and this we believe thou wilt perform amen just as the last word was spoken the carriage drew up before a little house and the doctor springing out gave his hand to caroline she followed him up the steps and while he waited for his ring to be answered wiped the tears from her eyes dory's case was soon disposed of it is a broken leg without any doubt said dr forsyth cheerily but we will have him comfortable in a few days and in a few weeks as well as ever and in the meantime he will be out of mischief this last spoken in lower tones to the long-suffering aunt miss perkins yes she said with a little quivering attempt at a smile i thought of that if he gets along all nice and right it will be a good thing for him maybe it might teach him a lesson you know he was where he hadn't ought to have been or it wouldn't have happened dory don't mean to do wrong doctor it is just kind of mischief he is so brimful of mischief that's what is the matter it will do him good to rest from it a little while said the doctor drawing on his gloves and in the meantime the young people will have to look after him a little my friend caroline here will come and cheer him up i fancy once in a while eh caroline i shall be very glad to sir said caroline if i can she had held the lamp for which the doctor called the gas not being in the right place to throw light where it was needed and had watched with bated breath the swift skilful fingers as they cared for the injured limb and had felt very sorry for the pale-faced boy caroline liked boys was used to boys 
had not ben and she been companions always she thought of several things she might do to cheer dory so the smile was free and glad with which she answered the doctor's question bless your heart said miss perkins patting her lovingly on the shoulder it would be worth a fortune to my dory if some nice young folks like you would take a little notice of him he is that fond of company that he doesn't know what to do with himself it isn't any wonder that he loves to be in the streets when he ought to be at home you see there's nobody but me to keep him company if you will come and see him once in a while i'll never forget it of you never christmas morning was as bright as though it had been a may day instead of december with the first gray streaks of dawn caroline awakened and lay still in very gladness to think over it all it would not do to be lonely or sad to-day even though she was far away from home this was to be a rare christmas day to be remembered in all her after years the first time she could think of herself as certainly a christian the days in which she had been indifferent to this matter were past the days in which she had been troubled in her conscience about the subject and angry with herself and angry with others were past the days in which she said with timid voice i hope i think were past since the evening when she took that never-to-be-forgotten ride with dr forsythe and bowed her head in the carriage and gave herself away to jesus there had been in her heart a glad solemn feeling that she belonged to him i am a servant of jesus christ she said the words often to herself almost startled at first but rejoicing in them she said the words again this christmas morning aloud steadily with a glad ring in her voice how glad mother would be and daisy and ben she had written to them the story she knew it would make their christmas bright then there were other lovely experiences connected with this day such a wonderful box as she had sent addressed to her mother or rather boxes for there were several of them in the first place the great pictorial unabridged dictionary which had long been the desire of ben's heart had actually gone to him by express a letter of his which in an unguarded moment she had given dorothy to read had made mention of this desire in such a comical way that dorothy had questioned and cross-questioned and by degrees had gotten the whole story then a few days before christmas she had announced her determination i am going to send a christmas present to ben i like him very much and am most sure that he would like me and i like the dictionary too it is so interesting to find new words in it i'm going to send him the pictorial edition with red lettered edges and all papa said i might if i wanted to and i want to ever so much you needn't say a word caroline i am just pleased to do it that's the reason i am doing it won't it be fun so the dictionary had gone with the other things the other things grew and grew in a wonderful manner there had been a white wool dress for daisy as like dorothy's as possible even to the soft creamy satin ribbon around the waist that too had to do with dorothy it had been caroline's ambition to make daisy a new dress taking every stitch in it herself to this end she had taken her mother into the secret and secured patterns and measurements and careful directions to be sure the dress was to be only a neat pretty calico suitable for spring the great charm of it was to be caroline's own work on it and new dresses were not so common to daisy bryant that a pretty calico had by any means lost its charms but plans had grown beyond all of caroline's hopes or expectations it was mrs forsythe who asked her about it one day dorothy having told her what caroline was doing for her little sister it was she who had said wouldn't you like to make daisy a dress like dorothy's there was a very large pattern of white cashmere the last time quite enough to make two dresses and dorothy will not need two alike i should be very glad to have you take it if you will 
and make little Daisy a dress just like hers. I think Dorothy would like it. She has fallen in love with your little sister, Caroline. And the plan, which at first so startled Caroline, had been so lovingly urged, and Dorothy was so eager over it, that it ended in two dresses going instead of one. A delicate spring calico, white with blue sprigs in it, and this soft, creamy white wool, finished at throat and wrists just like Dorothy's own, and tied around the waist with a soft white satin sash, just as she wore hers. Caroline could fancy Daisy in it, and it made her heart beat to think how sweet she would look. Her own plans for Ben had been to get him a new necktie and a pocket handkerchief. For Ben, like all boys of his age, liked neckties, fresh ones, bright ones, and as for handkerchiefs, he never seemed able to find one when he wanted it. This, too, became known in the household, and Dr. Forsythe took it up. Neckties, he said, that is a good idea. I always used to be bothered about those two things when I was a boy. See here, let us give Ben a necktie and handkerchief surprise. Mama and I will each send him one. Who will join us? To Caroline's unutterable surprise, even the stately grandmother smilingly consented to be one of the number, and of course Dorothy was delighted with the scheme. So, instead of one, went five beautiful new neckties, and five fine handkerchiefs to Ben. Caroline laughed over them as she lay in bed and thought it all out that morning. How surprised Ben would be, and how nice it was that he could have them to go with his new suit, for Ben had an entire new suit, spick and span. Only a few days before he had written her about it after this fashion. If Rufus Kedwin were at home, he would say I was in luck. What do you think? I have a new gray suit, coat, vest, and pantaloons, and they fit me to a tee. Where did I get them? Thereby hangs a tale last tuesday night i stayed late ever so late at the office there was some extra copying to be done which was needed in a hurry so i offered to stay and help i sent a little chap to tell mother so she wouldn't be scared and pitched in it was between eleven and twelve o'clock when i started for home as i turned the corner by peterson's the clothing store you know i saw a bright light I thought to myself that somebody must be sick to be lighted up like that so late. But the more I looked, the more the light worried me. It didn't seem like a lamp. It would flare up and then die down. I thought perhaps there was a fire in the grate. At last I concluded to cross the road and investigate, and it was a lucky thing I did. There was a fire in the grate which had been covered when the folks went to bed, but it had crept around somehow to the woodwork nobody seems to know exactly how and the long and short of it is that the fireboard and everything near it that was burnable was ablaze well i made a rumpus of course rang the bell and knocked and yelled all at once mr peterson and the clerks came flurrying down and we had a great time i didn't get home until two o'clock and mother was beginning to be frightened as good fortune would have it Mr. Peterson was pleased to think that I had saved his house, and between you and me I guess I did, for there was nobody stirring anywhere around, and they said the building would have been in a blaze in a very few minutes more. Well, ma'am, what did Mr. Peterson do but send for me the next morning, invite me into the back room, and fit me out to as nice a suit as ever a fellow had in his life, overcoat and all? Did you ever hear the like of that? I don't suppose he knew how much I needed it, or rather how much mother needed it. I got along with the old clothes better than she did, I verily believe. Of course I was glad enough to get them, but mother was so glad, Line, that she cried. And then Line had cried over this letter, and laughed over it too, and laughed again this morning, to think how pleased Ben would be with the neckties and handkerchiefs to go with his new suit and the dictionary she said aloud oh that dictionary won't it be just too splendid for anything 
End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Merry Christmas. But, after all, the gift which had gone carefully boxed to her mother, Caroline believed would be the crowning delight of this Christmas day. That had been such a surprise that even now it almost took away her breath just to think of it. She had been in the sewing room one day getting some directions from that good woman about Daisy's dress, for to tell the truth, she proved to be a most helpful practical adviser about that dress. Mrs. Packard was sewing busily on the machine, and Caroline, watching her, thought, as she had a hundred times before, if mother only had a sewing machine. But this thought she kept to herself. Is that another machine over in the corner? was the only thing she said aloud. Yes, said Mrs. Packard, reaching the end of her seam and stopping to cut the thread. It is and it is a machine that I don't like a bit, either. That is, I don't know anything about it, and don't want to. When I first came here, the woman who had been sewing for these folks got that machine ready, and bragged it up, and thought, of course, I was going to sew on it. It was new-fangled in every way to me, and I didn't like it at all. I worried and bothered over it for a day or two, and then Dr. Forsythe came in and asked how I liked it, and I told the truth, as I generally do. And that very day he sent up the kind of machine I was used to, and told me to shove the other one into a corner and let it go. He said a woman who had to do all the sewing for an entire family ought at least to have the comfort of sewing on the kind of machine she was used to and liked. There aren't many men like Dr. Forsythe in this world, my dear. Caroline heartily assented to this truth, then went over and examined the discarded machine. "'Why, it is just the kind my mother likes best,' she said, with a little squeal of delight which ended in a sigh. Watchful Mrs. Packard, who had become a good friend to Caroline, heard the sigh. "'Does your mother sew on a machine?' she asked. "'No, ma'am,' said Caroline, with a slight laugh. "'Not very often. When she goes to Mrs. Hammond's to sew, and to one or two other places where they have machines, she does, and this is the kind they have, and she likes it ever so much, but at home she sews by hand. "'My land!' said Mrs. Packard. "'I should think that would be hard work. She can't accomplish very much sewing, it appears to me.' "'She does,' said Caroline firmly, "'accomplish ever so much sewing.' She sews hard all winter long, makes dresses and shirts and underclothing, and all sorts of things for people, taking every stitch by hand. "'For the land's sake!' said Mrs. Packard. "'What in the world does she do it for? Nobody does that any more.' Caroline laughed a little sorrowfully. "'She does it just as we do a good many things, Mrs. Packard, because she has to.' She hasn't any machine of her own, and we children haven't got old enough yet to buy her one. But we are going to some day. That is the first thing Ben and I are going to do. Mrs. Packard kept her own counsel, and Caroline went away unaware that she had said anything of special interest to anybody. Neither did she connect this conversation with the question which Dr. Forsythe asked her one day. How did her mother employ her time in the winter? Did she use a sewing machine? What sort of a sewing machine would she use if she could have her choice? He ended by presenting the machine which stood unused in the corner to Caroline, with full permission to do with it what she pleased. Of course, he knew what she would please to do, and himself planned that the machine should be sent to the rooms to be put in thorough order, properly packed and forwarded to Mrs. Bryant. Had there ever been a Christmas day like this for her daughter Caroline? That young lady purposely refrained from turning herself in bed to take a look at certain packages which she felt pretty sure were piled on her chair or table, her object being to have the delights of the day last just as long as possible. 
first she must give her thoughts to mother and ben and daisy oh i omitted to say that six new dollies carefully dressed and with their elaborate wardrobes packed in a trunk had also been forwarded to daisy these were for the store of course perhaps it is not necessary to tell you how heartily dorothy entered into those plans and how very helpful her box of silks and laces as well as her skilful little fingers had been in the work dr forsythe had arranged that instead of a family gathering in the mother's room to receive the christmas morning gifts each person should have his or hers in their own room dorothy had demurred a little at this and caroline had wondered over it until the doctor had told her in a grave aside his reasons there is less nervous strain and excitement about the matter planned in that way he said if our little girl receives her presents when quite alone and all is quiet around her she will have opportunity to get over the first excitement and excitement is something which we must guard her against you know it is becoming increasingly important that we should do so at last caroline gave a spring from her bed and set about the business of dressing resolved that until her hair and bath were disposed of and she was ready all but her dress she would not look at a single gift i know i have some things there she said with a laugh and resolutely turning her back to the chair but i hope i have self-control enough to let them alone until the proper minute the proper minute came at last and caroline found her powers of self-control taxed to their utmost every gift there was a surprise she dived first into a medium-sized box and found it to be a very handsome one silk lined from the stately grandmother a glove and handkerchief box with six pairs of gloves and one dozen fine hem-stitched handkerchiefs with her initials carefully worked in the corners what a wonderful gift to come to caroline bryant six pairs of gloves at once for a girl who had gone even to church many a time bare-handed because her gloves were so shabby she was not willing to wear them then came a large box so large that she could but wonder what it could contain a card lay on the top addressed in a delicate hand for my caroline with mrs forsythe's dear love the little squeal with which caroline discovered the contents was quickly suppressed lest dorothy should hear a new dress soft fine and beautiful in color a very dark maroon beautifully made and beautifully trimmed to one sleeve was pinned a paper which said again in mrs forsythe's writing to be put on early on christmas morning and worn through the day the doctor's gift was a bible how elegant it was caroline did not know she only knew the covers were soft the paper was as thin almost as a cobweb yet seemed very strong and while it was small enough in size to be conveniently carried to church and sunday school it contained so many other things besides the bible that her amazement was very great over the thought that so much could be put into so small a space and yet have the print so clear and beautiful it had as much in it as the large family bible at home grandmother's you know wrote caroline to her mother yet that is as much as ten times larger than this her full name in gold letters gleamed from the back instinctively she had left dorothy's little package to the last it is small and sweet like herself she said clasping the tiny white box and wondering what treasure the fair darling had bestowed upon her this time her voice did penetrate to dorothy's room and made her laugh how could it be helped what should lie gleaming at her from the delicate folds of cotton which surrounded it but a tiny chatelaine watch ticking away with all its might it is such a trouble to be always looking at the schoolroom clock said the card lying by the side of the watch and underneath for my dear darling caroline from dorothy i'm sure you will excuse caroline for being so wildly excited that it seemed almost impossible to get into her new dress and be ready for breakfast 
so interested was she in her own belongings and especially in viewing herself in the glass when the new dress was properly adjusted that she well nigh missed the package pushed quite under her chair and when at last she spied it she stopped wonderingly and said aloud what can that be there are certainly no more presents this morning i almost hope there are not i do not see how i could bear any more still she stooped and drew out a neat square-looking package done up in brown paper and read between exclamations of astonishment and bewilderment the address benjamin f bryant with christmas greetings from dr forsythe and dorothy what could that mean if any person living had had christmas greetings from dr forsythe and dorothy it was surely benjamin bryant had she not seen them herself go off by express while she stood staring and wondering a slip of paper in the corner of the package caught her attention she drew it forth and read to be opened by caroline and delivered by her to ben at her convenience dear me she said half laughing half crying at my convenience if ben doesn't get it whatever it is until i can deliver it to him i am afraid he will have to wait a long time i must look this minute and see what the dear boy has oh oh what people they are it seems a pity to have to tell you that caroline bryant sat flat on the floor new dress and all and made her eyes red by crying for joy for the contents of that package behold it was a new stenograph a very dainty finish packed neatly in its own leathern case such a present as that she was sure meant a great deal to ben meant more suits of clothes and books and comforts for mother and daisy for ben with such a knowledge of the stenograph as he would soon have when it was in his possession would be able to earn his living dr forsythe had said so what will he say she said meaning ben i wonder if i shall write to him about it or keep it until i go or what i ought to do it does not seem as though i ought to keep it from him until spring oh ben you don't know what is coming to you while she was bathing her eyes trying to take away the redness which the happy tears had brought there came a gentle tap at her door she made all speed to open it and there stood dr forsythe merry christmas he said interrupting her eager oh dr forsythe then laughing over her oh i forgot merry christmas dr forsythe she continued eagerly i've seen them all and i don't know what i shall do i don't know how to say what i think and feel and i couldn't say it anyway never mind said dr forsythe it isn't necessary and besides there isn't time we have delayed breakfast this morning to give you young people time to get over your first fever but it is getting late it seems to me i haven't seen that dress on before it is very becoming now i will agree to imagine all the rest of the things that you would like to say because i want you to go down to the back parlor for me on an errand the fact is there is a little present there for you which has been omitted or at least it was not convenient to put it into your room you will find it in the back parlor by the south window another present said caroline how can i possibly have another present i have everything now that anybody could want very well he said smiling you may do as you like about accepting the present after you see it if you think you would like it and like to keep it with you today you may do so if not just let it be where it is in the corner and i'll attend to it but run right down now please and see about it is it marked asked caroline almost breathless with excitement as she ran down the stairs then dr forsythe laughed merrily no it isn't marked he said at least it hasn't your name on it i think you will recognize it if you do not come back and i will go and assist you caroline sped through the hall on swift feet her brain in a whirl of excitement 
what could there be in the back parlor for her after all the elegant presents she had received she pushed open the door and made all speed toward the south window looking curiously on the floor on the chairs under the sofa as she passed no package was to be seen nothing but the usual furniture of the room perhaps he meant in the window seat the searcher said and put out her hand to push back aside the curtain drew it suddenly back giving a faint scream the while and was folded in ben's arms such a time as there was in the back parlor for the next five minutes may be better imagined than described i came last night on the twelve o'clock ben explained in answer to her bewilderment yes i have been in the house all night they would not let me disturb you the doctor said you would not get any more sleep if i did and i was tremendously sleepy myself oh yes they expected me i came with mr holden he got a pass for me the superintendent of the road is a particular friend he is going on to new york to visit miss webster mr holden is you know not the superintendent dr forsythe wrote to me to come he said i was to be your christmas surprise and he came himself in the carriage to the depot and asked mr holden to come and spend the night with us but he couldn't he was expected in new york this morning i say line isn't he magnificent though caroline knew he meant dr forsythe and not mr holden though well aware that his adjective would do to apply to either gentleman well she said catching her breath and speaking almost hysterically i was never so surprised in my life did you ever see anything so wonderful oh ben how nice you look in your new coat and the neckties got there in time for you to wear one didn't they how nice that was of mother to get them out for you oh ben ben it's too good to believe and she reached up and kissed his brown cheeks ecstatically it's a high old time said ben and no mistake i thought when my christmas presents came that christmas had done everything it could for me for once and i wondered what mother meant by giving me my presents the night before you see she and mr holden got this up and didn't say anything to me until about an hour before the train started line i don't know that i ever saw anybody in my life that clothes made such a difference in you are as pretty as a picture did you know it what do fanny kedwin and rufus say to all this where are they by the way will i be likely to see them you will be likely to take dinner with them said caroline complacently dr forsythe has invited fanny and rufus to come here to dinner at five o'clock this afternoon he asked me if i would like to have them come and of course i would because they seem like a bit of home and another thing i knew they would enjoy it they are having kind of a lonesome time at their uncle's their cousins are older than they and then i don't think rufus and fanny are dressed well enough to suit them and they go off and have good times and leave those two alone with their aunt dr forsythe is going to send the carriage for them and make everything just as pleasant as he can oh ben you must come right away there is the bell for prayers and i haven't kissed dorothy good morning yet you can't think how sweet she is sometimes my heart just aches to have daisy see her they would love each other so much daisy has named her dearest doll after her already said ben following his sister down the long hall and halting her just before the dining-room door was opened to say look here line this is new business to me being in a city house you know you must catch hold of my coat-tail or something if i don't do just right i suppose i'll make a hundred mistakes no you won't said caroline cheerily it isn't half so dreadful as i thought it would be you just have to be kind and pleasant and think about other people's comforts instead of your own just as you always do ben and then you are all right of course there are little things to notice at the table but it is easy to notice how other people do and do like them i've gotten over some of my silliness ben since i've been here and then caroline laughed to herself gleefully not over anything which had just been talked about but over the state of mind ben would be in 
if he only knew what was waiting up in her room for him at that minute the ordeal of breakfast was gotten through with very nicely caroline found herself proud of instead of being embarrassed for the manly boy who sat erect in his chair and answered promptly all questions that were put to him not merely with a yes sir and no sir but volunteering little bits of interesting items connected with his journey or with the town in which he lived also he showed the most respectful attention when the grandmother spoke and when the meal was over and she was about to leave the room sprang forward and opened the door for her this was no more it is true than he was in the habit of doing for his own mother but some boys wouldn't have thought of it therein ben found he had an advantage over many country boys who make their first visit to city homes he had been brought up to be respectful to his mother and indeed to all persons older than himself to his satisfaction he found that the training in this and many other small matters which he had received in his own quiet home stood him in good stead when he came where they used what fanny kedwin called cityfied ways End of chapter 21